What is up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a new episode of the Triflix Cast. I'm Tristan Watkins, and this is the show where we interview creatives and innovators and individuals and try to understand what it is that drives their passion, learn a little bit about them along the way. Today we have Mr. Luke Rex. Yeah, thanks for having me. Dude, I thanks. appreciate it. No, I'm super pumped to be on. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming on. And uh, today we'll be learning about uh, his entrepreneurial background, uh, mm-hmm. some nonprofit work that he's uh, co-founded. Started, uh, yeah, your, yeah, yeah, co-founded, co-founded, mm-hmm. uh, some uh, startups that he's been working on, mm-hmm. and uh, a little bit about his background that has led him into this. Yeah. So, Luke, I'll give it to you. Tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Man. Well, uh, I'll just kind of dive in and start with my why, because that's really, um, I mean, really, really where my drive and my passion really starts, and mm-hmm. it's more of my story. Um, but growing up um, within um, school, I had an IEP. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what an IEP is. But, uh, no, what's an IEP? Um, it, uh, it pretty much, um, I kind of consider it like a diagnosis, diagnosis process. Um, and it pretty much uh, means that specific students need extra resources to learn in a better way. Okay. So they need extra attention. Um, So I was a resource student. I had um, I was pulled out of classes and had all my tests read to me. I had extended time on tests um, pretty much um, just over my entire education. I mean, I my I graduated from my IEP my senior year. Mm -hmm. Um, So for years I was doing this and it built up just uh, in my mind how I'm different and yeah. how um, I'm not gonna be able to excel and uh, learn at the proper pace, uh, mm-hmm. whatever the proper pace would be. Was that like, um, discouraging or was oh, that just good to learn? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was one of the, I mean, it was one of the most discouraging things I would say that consistently happened to me over time. I mean, mm-hmm. school is a place where uh, you should go to learn and school is a place for me was where I just felt like I was completely different. I would I would literally physically be taken out of that class. Mm-hmm. Um, and that alone um, just tells everybody in that entire room, you're different. And that yeah. consistently happened for years. So um, taking that out, um, uh, <clears throat> acknowledging my IEP, uh, I found an opportunity within the school. I went to Noblesville High School and graduated up north and um, on the north side of Indianapolis. Um, and there was an innovations class, innovation and open source learning curriculum. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was an opportunity for um, students to pursue what they want, um, when they want, really how they want. So it just sounded amazing. My brother went through it. Um, he patented a product, um, which was a, I'm pretty sure they called it the U scoop. It just solved the problem of pouring protein powder into a water bottle. Yeah. Um, but uh, through that, he really um, influenced me to get into that class, which was um, a huge blessing in the end. Um, so this class was only for uh, sophomores and up. Um, so I entered the class my sophomore year, stayed in it through my senior year, um, and entered into it uh, with a strong passion with movie making um, mm-hmm. and, and film work. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, I, I, everyone has their GoPro and everything. That's when GoPros really took off. Um, everyone's, all these GoPro videos are being kicked out. Really, um, just learning the base of the creative process um, yep. when creating film and storytelling. Um, so what I, I mean, what did I do? I acknowledged that I didn't really know much. So I networked. Um, I just constantly re- uh, reached out to different producers, directors. Um, I got invited to a couple different James Franco uh, movie shoots. He helps out low budget college uh, students. Mind you, a low budget film was 49 million and under. That's, yeah. that's a low budget film. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, it was a phenomenal experience being on set, seeing every part of production from, um, I mean, everyone who's doing audio to everyone who's doing makeup. I mean, to interacting with talent and the different actors, it was really, really amazing experience. Mm -hmm. But everything that shifted, um, I mean, you would think that that experience going there and being on set and seeing everything would kind of solidify like my passion or- uh, What what was that like being on set? It was really amazing, honestly. I mean, it was, I was an outsider coming in, so I was just observing everything. Everything was new to me. I was talking to every single person that was coming up. Um, I mean, even to the guy who just screams cut and mm-hmm. like, like, uh, rolling and all these different things, yeah. that was his only job and <laughs> just interact with him, talk with him. Um, but it was, it was more of the flow that I was really fascinated with and how the director, the creative vision behind this, how he was leading people mm-hmm. because, um, 
And generally, I believe that if a movie doesn't perform very well, that kind of is a reflection on the director because right. he's the leader. I mean, he's leading and guiding all these people to share the vision that he sees in his mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, all in all, I mean, it was it was a decent film. It was very interesting. It was uh, bikers and um, more of a preppy, um, uh, preppy boys. And they were, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. It was it was an okay film, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't too intrigued by the film. I was more intrigued by everything happening with right. the film. It was a le- it was a learning process. Absolutely. You, right? And um, but what happened was um, I connected with this uh, producer named Javier Guerrillo Marsquatch, and yeah. I still feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong till today. Um, but he was one of the producers for uh, Need for Speed. And um, it took me six months to get on a five minute phone call with him. And in that five minute phone call, it changed my entire passion for film and movie making because um, I was going through a list of questions. Again, it took me six months and a five minute call. And this um, Javier was driving from set to set. And that was all the time I had with him. So one that acknowledges the level of grind and the level of passion and commitment that it takes because, I mean, every minute of your day is taken. Um, but what he told me at one point in that conversation, um, after multiple different questions, he interrupted me and just said, Luke, know what the hell you're doing before you come out to LA, because if you don't, you're going to waste years of your life. And that really set in, uh, and just, I had to kind of reanalyze everything because I was seeing what actual movie production looks like, Mm -hmm. um, and how intense it is. Um, and I totally decided, uh, probably that next week that I just, I wanted to stop. I didn't want to pursue film and movie or movie making, but I wanted to stay in film because I love storytelling. The fact that Mm -hmm. we can walk into a movie theater and have all of our emotions controlled for an hour and a half by someone else. Yeah. Like is insane through the visuals and through sound. It's fascinating. So where do you think that like original drive for film came from? Because it it sounds like it went away Mm -hmm. kind of quickly whenever you realized. Yeah. Not necessarily the amount of work. I feel like mm-hmm. you probably have good work ethic that you could do it if you wanted to. But like, where did that come from? And why do you think that it went away so easily mm-hmm. whenever he answered that? I would say that it came from um, I'm an auditory list. I'm, that's how I learn. I right. learned I learned through my ears. That's why tests were read to me and I had extended time. I had more time to process. Um, so growing up, um, movies and TV shows were something that always stood out. And mm-hmm. I would really get into them. Very emotional. I mean, I would walk out of movies like. I'm pretty sure the movie Real Steel, uh-huh. uh, there's robots fighting and everything. You know, it was, it was kind of a cheesy movie looking back on it and everything. But I walked out of the movie like crying. Yeah. I was I really engulfed myself in movies. So that's really where it started. And I was fascinated. Um, I mean, I bought my own camera set up. I got a Canon um, T5i yeah. and then a Rebel T5i. And then I still use that today but so it, like, um, provided some sort of yeah like, no I connection mean, absolutely right. it was the connection and it allowed it was a, it was a stepping stone so that's really where my passion came it's just throughout my entire life i was always fascinated yeah. and i was I would, I would always um be committed to um being vulnerable while consuming yeah. because a lot of work and a lot of passion is put into these projects and yep. it's i feel like on the viewers to consume it properly as well yeah Um, but I would say all that stopped very quickly just because, um, I mean, I saw my future flash before my eyes and how, I mean, I heard, um, the stress that Javier had in his voice, all these other producers and directors I'm connecting with who are shooting different Audi commercials. Um, I was really fascinated with car commercials just because it's very high production and very short amount of time to get a clear picture through. Right. Um, so a lot of them, I just, I could sense like the stress and yes, they were passionate about it, but it just, I knew it wasn't for me. Right. I just, I just knew it. But and you still wanted to find a way to incorporate it in your life. Somehow. Absolutely. Just not absolutely. the traditional Hollywood route. Mm-hmm. 100%. So about a year and a half went by and within the class, I started, try to start a couple of different things, try to do a little media company that didn't work out just cause the, I mean, there was just nothing there, but um, what I had the opportunity to do um, at this point in time, I kind of put all filmmaking to the side and I had an opportunity um, to speak to this man named Kobe in Ghana. Uh, Kobe is the founder of Diswapanui, which is a company that um, cleans different uh, beaches all over Ghana mm-hmm. um, and then it provides a soccer game for everybody and then a huge cooked meal for hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, so how, how did you come in contact with mm-hmm. them? So uh, an um, amazing man named Pete Freeman came in, shared his testimony, uh, and then introduced um, Kobe just okay. because um, he has done a lot of uh, nonprofit work in, in the past, um, a lot with um, different 
moms and women in Ghana and really empowering them and doing a lot of really amazing work. But he in introduced Kobe because Kobe was like almost like a leader in this community. Mm -hmm. um, within 45 minutes, we were on a Skype call with him. Yeah. Um, and at the time, um, I was just asking different questions about his environment. Prior to this, um, I, this is a very I mean, important factor. Um, I've traveled to Kenya once, um, just on a missions trip. Um, and um, again, like for me, I, I'm an observer. I listen. I'm, I'm always, I, I kind of take myself out of the room and observe what's going on. Yeah. Um, and I did that in Kenya. Phenomenal experience. Um, so I was just analyzing needs pretty much when talking to Kobe. And the need that I just kept hearing is a school. They need a school. They need a school. So um, that next week, um, the co-founder and I, he is, his name's also Luke, Luke and Luke. He's a childhood best friend. I mean, we, we've mm -hmm. grown up and he's, he's doing some really amazing things right now. Um, we decided we were going to build the school. Yeah. And so we had no idea because then we looked to each other and we just had no idea what to do. We're like, how do you build a school in a third world country where all you do, I mean, the only connection you know is a guy named Kobe. You don't know the dynamic of the government system. You don't know the economy there. You don't yeah. know anything. Right. So how do you build a school? So we did the same thing. We, uh, we reached out and networked. We reached out uh, to people who have accomplished these things and have that knowledge. So one of my mentors uh, that we connected with, with uh, was Scott Harrison of Charity Water. Mm. Um, are you familiar with Charity Water? By no, chance? no, okay. I'm not. Yeah. So Charity Water is um, one of the world's most successful um, nonprofit um, organizations that help clean water and the clean water problem in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and he has an amazing story within himself. He uh, was a club promoter for about 10 years, had a breakthrough when he went on a cruise ship called uh, Mercy Ships down the uh, west coast of Africa, ended up in Liberia and realized the water problem. Yeah. And the, and his job was just to capture and film and to document. Yeah. He came back and used all of his resources for the past 10 years of being in clubs and pr uh, promoted and networked um, this problem to them, raising thousands of thousands of dollars. And that's how we formed Charity Water um, by connecting and really doing amazing things to grow awareness of these different problems. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little bit of background about Scott, but he um, really, really was a huge influence, um, especially in the nonprofit of visionary work and how to um, define a proper vision. Because at the time I had no idea what I was doing. Um, really, right. honestly, I was, like, I was stuck. Because how old were you whenever you were trying to do this project? I was starting the nonprofit when I was 17. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I was like, that's ambitious and... I don't think most 17 year olds would have taken on yeah. such a feat. But, right. But you like, I, I, don't, I don't know, like whenever you first met Kobe or right when you were hearing about him before the 45 minute call uh, or not before, at what point like did you think like we should do this? Like what was it about that situation mm -hmm. that inspired you to? pursue so it was um just the need that these students aren't getting provided any education and like um i got sent a picture of about a four or five year old boy holding a whiskey bottle and just like that's that's just how it is over there he was drinking water out of it right but like um after going to kenya and seeing um honestly what human suffering is at its worst which is hunger i believe that's one version of it right um and just seeing the I mean, it, it breaks your heart. I mean, it really changes you and moves you as a person. Um, and after seeing that, it's like, okay, how can we impact and change this community? Because we can't necessarily come in because the Ghanaians don't really have a um, strong relationship with uh, the white man. Right. Um, so we can't come into this environment and try and grow and cultivate something, but we can impact the minds. So let's start the school and start an educational system. So I broke down this class that I was in, the Innovation Open Source Curriculum class and broke it down into 10 pillars that can be replicated anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. regardless of what resources you have, because it's all based off of mindset development. Yeah. Um, so um, prior to, um, there's one thing I was gonna loop back around, honestly, but um, the need that we saw was just, it needed to be built, the school needed to be built, but we didn't wanna have the missions trip mentality of we're gonna come in, provide almost temporary hope and then leave. Yeah. So that's when the nonprofit came in because that's how it can be sustainable. Um, and what blows what blows everyone's mind is it took three grand, thirty five hundred dollars to build the school, pay for teachers, pay for uniforms, pay for school supplies, everything for an entire year. Thirty five hundred dollars. Um, granted, it was a classroom of four, and there was one lunch room, but that alone provided them with a ton of different opportunities. But right. um, I mean. 
through that entire process, I learned a, a lot, but um, graduating, um, still on the timeline, um, we ended up building the school, phenomenal, it was fantastic. Um, both Luke and I graduate, and then um, outside of school, it's kind of like, well, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, I decided not to go to college, university, um, since I'm kind of already doing my own thing, I kind of want to stay with that. Right. I really like it, I feel fulfilled, and I feel that I can be a student of the world. Um, and that's one thing that Jeremy also talks yeah. about. Yeah, we um, had Jeremy on a couple episodes ago, and he mm -hmm. was really big on don't let your education stop at school. Basically yeah. continue to find ways to learn in whatever environment you're in. So, mm -hmm. so that's something you've adopted then? Absolutely. He has definitely influenced me in, um, in a very positive way to be a student of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, that alone, um, because we have, access, we have access to hundreds of different resources. I mean, if you want to dive into the personal development, I mean, health, like you have everything from your phone, mm -hmm. videos. I mean, YouTube is amazing. Uh, books, podcasts, everything. Right. Um, so um, really just try to self-educate uh, myself outside of high school. But um, during my senior year, I had an internship at a tech company um, on the north side. It was a home uh, automation company. Um, so I was working um, as an installer right out of high school for about nine months. I was just a technician. I was in the field working with these guys. Okay. But the homes I was in, was it was the who's who of Indiana. I mean, I mean, there is rich and then there's wealth and we were in the wealth. I mean, you really, really get a clear picture of once you reach a certain point of success, how you can use that wealth and how you can use your knowledge and really make an impact on the world. Yeah. And what was your takeaway from that? <clears throat> um, to always think of others. 100 percent. Yeah. Um, Dave Lindsay, the founder of Defenders Direct, mm -hmm. uh, they're now a billion dollar company. Um, when I met him, I mean, he took the time to talk to me and he, I mean, he was in I mean, he was just, it, it blew me away just because of his care and everything. I mean, his house was absolutely amazing. But what I found out was he, he only lives there like once or twice, um, or one or two weeks out of the year. Yeah. All the other times he lives in New York, but that home is actually used for people. Um, cause he has a nonprofit all over the world and he pulls people in from that nonprofit um, that uh, are <coughs> movers and shakers and ambitious and want to make something of themselves, brings them into the States, hosts them, hosts, hosts them in these homes and educates them, um, helps them get their citizenship and then releases them back into, um, they just get go back into society and then they start like a whole new life. Really, really, that is using wealth at your finest. There's a house manager literally providing everything for these people. That's a very, very clear vision of how to use your wealth properly. Mm -hmm. um, which was inspiring, yeah. beyond inspiring. Um, time moves on. Um, I realized that I don't want to be a technician and that there wasn't too many um, opportunities at that specific company. I feel like I served my time there and really took away everything that I needed to then approach the next best opportunity, right. which was um, which I'm currently working on now is outhouse co-working. Um, so for and about what is yeah. what is. What is the company, but also what does co-working mean mm -hmm. for people that don't? For sure. Right. I'll break it down. Um, so Outhouse Coworking is a, one of the nation's first commercial furniture showrooms that doubles as a co-working space. What co-working is, it's um, getting entrepreneurs, independent workers, startups, and all working under the same roof. Because a lot of these startups, they can't necessarily go out and buy and lease an entire building. They can buy an office for $1,500. They can get a membership for 129 to get out of the house or 129 yeah, a month to get so out of the house. Can, right. um, so it's getting everyone under the same, under the same roof and cultivating um, an environment within it. Um, and really co-working, I believe is a way that everyone within an environment can grow. Um, I mean, a lot of co-working spaces will claim to have a collaborative environment, um, but no one necessarily knows what that is, especially in Indy, I believe. Right. It's just cause it has been cultivated yet. Um, but, uh, while I was working at Triphase, um, about 50 hours a week, I worked for outhouse for another about 25, 30 hours a week for free. Triphase was the installation. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. My bad. Yeah. Um, Triphase technologies was the installation company, a phenomenal company. That owner, um, uh, really guided me through a lot. Ama amazing people. They really are a positive light. Just, um, I don't believe that it was, I was supposed to be serving, um, that long in that company. Yeah. Um, but um moving on to um outhouse i was working there for about 25 30 hours a week in addition to that extra 50 at triphase 
Um, so uh, I was just exhausted. I was dead, but um, I was doing it for free. I saw an opportunity here. The owner, um, Taylor Jennings, uh, a very good mentor of mine, um, just consistently gave me opportunities to prove myself almost. He invited me to do a Salesforce course. So I completed the course. Um, haven't got my Salesforce administration uh, license yet, but that's in the future um, to do. Um, but just every opportunity he gave me, I was just trying to do. Hey, do you need help cleaning the place? Okay, done. I'll help clean it. Hey, what can I help with marketing? Hey, are you doing anything with wholesaling and real estate? Yeah. Like really, really just providing um, as much value as I can. And then on my birthday, my 23rd birthday of 2019 is when um, that week I left Triface and I started at Outhouse. Was that a co-founder or was it something you started by yourself? Outhouse? Yeah. Um, this was something that I was walking into. It was already founded. Okay. Um, so uh, I walked into it and now I'm running operations. Okay, great. Um, uh, operations and all marketing as well. Um, so what's fascinating about the outhouse business model is that there's standards. The two most expensive parts of a co-working space is furniture and construction. And since we're a commercial furniture dealership, we get very high discounts on, um, on really expensive, nice, comfortable furniture, um, which generally you won't see provided um, properly in a lot of other co-working spaces. Right. And we really try to hit hard on the environment. So we have standards in all of our locations. As soon as you walk in, you're stepping on AstroTurf because mm -hmm. it automatically triggers your mind to think I'm not at home. This is a different feeling. This is kind of cozy. Like it's activating different things okay. in your brain to really start functioning differently in a different environment. Second, there's always movement. Uh, we have big ass fans in there. Um, we have three of them at our new location. And um, if someone's there at 2 or 3 a.m., something needs to be moving. Something needs to be happening because yeah. it's just one more thing to really allow anybody to come in and get focused um, and really be productive with their time just based off of physical environment. Yeah, that's actually like a principle in cinematography is that Phenomenal. the only reason you would ever have a stationary, like a shot with nothing moving in it. Mm -hmm as if it helped progress the story and rarely will you ever see that in a story because yeah. there's always movement whether that's the camera whether that's you know a subject mm -hmm. or some the backgrounds moving there's always something moving so mm -hmm. i think that's i don't know if that you did that on purpose but that is really neat that it it translates between both of the things that you're interested in mm -hmm. that no that actually that is very very interesting i can't say credit for um creating the standards um that was uh taylor um has been in the commercial furniture industry for years um, and he um, defined uh, the outhouse business model and everything. Um, I feel like I, the reason why I felt called to come into it is because I, I felt like there was a vision that needed mm -hmm. to be created with this space because there was something here. Um, and then the third standard we have is just sound masking because that drowns out all extra noises to allow people to focus better. Um, but um, fast forward, I mean, an entire year, I'm learning everything. I Again, I don't know a lot of what I'm doing, so I'm learning by experience, and I'm just reaching out to people, working 7,500 hours a week, just learning, 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 constant failure. So what is, out of all your experiences that you've mm -hmm. been through so far, what do you think has been the biggest, uh, like the most value mm -hmm. for, for the time put in as for learning? As far as like mentorships or just doing you. all the research on your own, like where does... It was absolutely the nonprofit work in every single way yeah. because um, I didn't just learn stuff for the tangible business. I learned stuff about my life and mm -hmm. I learned stuff about how to be a better human yeah. and how to treat people properly and with respect and give them love and show them love. Mm -hmm. Um, so absolutely, that was that was by far the biggest takeaway uh, yeah. from all that. And, and that's something you can apply to anywhere else you're going, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I mean, a lot of um, the things that I've been built off of are through a lot of my experiences with Kenya and a lot of these different stories. Um, I mean, there's hundreds of different stories within that alone. But um, definitely my biggest takeaway was through the nonprofit work. Yeah, mm -hmm. right on, man. Absolutely. All right, so... I got to take a brief 20 seconds real quick yeah, no, just to good. give a shout out to Hill Zion Records. They've uh, been gracious and have been uh, sponsoring the last episode, this episode, oh, and we've built a partnership. So moving forward, I think we'll uh, continue working with them. Great. So if you guys are interested in some good, good, classy, clean music, Hill Zion Records, uh, they produce rap music. Um, I think they're starting to venture into some other genres as well. But uh, overall, they're based out of Tennessee. Oh, so yeah. if you guys are ever in Tennessee and you want to stop by, they I believe they have a studio down there now. But um, 
they have uh, they're working on a new website. They'll be releasing some new music. They're building up some new partnerships down there, and uh, we're happy to be one of those. So Hill Zion Records. Congrats. Thanks, man. Yeah, That's they're they're really good guys. Yeah. Um, we've uh, we've worked with them for a long time. Mm. We used to produce like lyric videos. That's actually how I got started in filmmaking and mm. editing and all that. So I was producing lyric videos and I produced some for other people on his label. And then the owner came to me asking for some. Wow. Yeah. That's and amazing. That was like three years ago. And then out of the blue, he just gave me a call and he's like, hey, you still doing music? It's like, sure. He's yeah. like, let's let's lay out some sort of uh, business deal where like we're the sole providers of their mm. media moving forward. So we'll be like working towards like music videos and all that. Wow. Yeah. It's That's a cool awesome. company. Yeah, it really it's is. Fantastic. But uh, let's let's bring this back into mm. you. Yeah. Uh, Whatever you were growing up, it sounded like your original vision was like to go into this filmmaking industry. But was that was that truly your original thought? Like, gr- like at your youngest age, whatever your answer is, usually policeman or astronaut mm-hmm. or football player. Like, mm-hmm. did you ever expect anything like what you're doing now? Um, absolutely. I expected to be um, doing something for myself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, because um, though um, Taylor. T- technically is my boss i consider him as a mentor and i'm working for myself to achieve this vision yeah. and i knew that that was always going to happen not sure in what form what way what's the specific field but i knew that would happen mm-hmm. and um, i'm just blessed to have the opportunity that that is how um, i'm living my life now because that just opens up the door for so much more growth it yeah. really does um, so, I mean, from the beginning I wanted to be, I mean, honestly, I wanted to be a Marine. That was my thing. I grew up, my grandpa was a Marine. Yeah. Um, and then I held a camera and then from that point on, I'm like, I can create something for myself. Right. I, I really can. I'm seeing everyone. I mean, the boom of Casey Neistat hit YouTube and that yep. changed the entire dynamic of filmmaking, um, and vlogging within itself. Yeah. Um, and that alone was very, very inspiring to see. It was very inspiring. It, it was really neat whenever he blew up too, because vlogging didn't really exist before. And he did, he wasn't the originator of the concept, but he was definitely the one to popularize it. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting to see that even after hundreds, relatively like hundreds of years of filmmaking and, you know, thousands of years of storytelling mm-hmm. and, you know, mid 2000s, we're still getting new formats and new mediums and new ways of telling stories. Even though, you know, like the principle has been around for years. So right. for me, whenever I saw a nice stack come out, that was uh, definitely one of the, the cooler aspects. And mm-hmm. since then, like we still like YouTube's completely changed it as a whole. Absolutely. Anybody, like you said, a small budget of 49 million for a Franco film, film, right? Low Some budget. low budget. Yeah. But now it's like you and your friends can go out for like three grand, make a camera, post it on YouTube and go viral mm-hmm. in a day. Mm-hmm. And that's like completely blow, it blows my mind because... Before that, the only way to get something to travel that far was either to pay for the publicity or just pray that like word of mouth was enough to mm-hmm. carry it. Yeah, it, I would say the very inspiring part um, from Casey to me, um, yeah, his his film and uh, uh, cinematography work and what he gave, I believe, gave and shared with YouTube was phenomenal and amazing. But what really spoke out to me was everything that he was, his concept of do more, mm-hmm. the fact the tattoo he has. That alone, I leaned into that and I just, I really try to dive deep on like, what, like, what does that mean? I'm a young kid. Like I want to make something of my life, but do more. Like what else can I do? And that alone, um, specifically to those words, I just ingrained them in every opportunity that I was seeking and everyone that I was talking to, just what else can I do? Do more. Yeah. Um, so Casey alone as, um, an entrepreneur and his mindset and how he, um, conducts himself. Um, I find that part extremely, extremely inspiring. Yeah. So what is, what does do more mean to you now? Um, I mean, do more for me. Um, that's, that's a very interesting question. I haven't been asked that. So that's a good question. Um, do more for me is, um, I believe that connects with love because, um, that's the one thing that I see a lot of people lacking when, um, I mean, I talk to a lot of people every single day. We all do. Um, and that's the one consistent thing that, I felt like I saw um, as Casey was sharing all these videos, it was always love. He was always giving people love. There was always a smile on his face. There was always a laugh happening. So do more is like, really, how can I do more to show other people love? How can I do more to show people love in my on my personal brand? How can I show more love with Outhouse and mm-hmm. make an impact? So that's really what it means to me now. It's just how can, how can I do more and how can I show more love? Yeah. to others that's awesome mm. 
All right. So, um, it sounds like we we covered pretty much the what inspired you to start out timeline. Talking, yeah, yeah, like going through everything, uh, talking about mostly like the mentors and how it's evolved into your career current career path. One thing, I mean, a, a big impact on my life, like was was the Kenya um, mm-hmm. experiences, absolutely, um, and that's where I learned what leadership is. Yeah. Um, in Kenya, there's 47 tribes, um, and the Maasai tribe, uh, the tribe I live with, is the Maasai tribe. And now, when I go out there and live, I'm living in a very remote area. It's National Geographic. I'm living in a mud hut. Yeah. My bed's not the most comfortable thing. Pitch black. The stars are the most amazing thing you'll ever see in your entire life. No um, light pollution, nothing. But I learned leadership um, because the, uh, who I live with over there is one of the main bishops of Kenya. He mm-hmm. used to be. So he oversaw 200 churches. Very, very amazing man. Very well respected. He has lots of cattle, yeah. if that means something to you. He's, he's very, very um, well said in Kenya. Right. Um, but he, he told me this story of how to approach life. Um, so a Maasai boy, um, in order to enter manhood, they don't practice this anymore, but they, they have to kill a lion. So when I heard that was, we were all sitting, uh, around the fire, stars were out and everything. Um, our guard was just walking around making sure, cause there's packs of hyenas that'll run by and everything. And it was, it was a really amazing experience, really set, set the environment. But he, I asked him, I'm just, how do you practice? to do something like that? How do you practice to kill a lion? Because I don't see any YouTube tutorials on how to do that. Like, yeah. I, I don't know where that comes from. And he just walked through the entire story of how, how it's performed. So there's about 100 boys that surround a lion and all of them are singing at a very high pitch rate. At, I can't do it as well as them, but it's just like a, yeah. just all of them, 100 boys, just that close and the closer and closer that they get. Um, again, I can't do it as, as well as the Kenyans, but they have like this deeper sound. It's like a, huh? Yeah, <gasps> and right. they're singing to the lion. What James says, they're singing to the lion to let the lion know that it's okay. Uh, but what the lion's looking for is fear in all of these boys' eyes because that's his out to survival. The first boy who throws a spear, that's who the lion's attacking. Mind you, this is a full-grown male lion. You are in his environment, mm-hmm. like you are the minority here. Um, and first boy who throws a spear, that's who the lion's coming after. And it's the responsibility of the other two Kenyan boys right next to him to kill that lion. All three, they collectively enter manhood. That's not the first thing James told me um, when I asked, like, how, how is this done? Um, that's what he said second. What he said first was, it's no practice, it's just courage. Yeah. And that's it. That's the only way they do it. They don't, they don't practice at all. They literally all just walk out there with an insane abundance of courage. And that's how I view leadership. And I saw him as the leader he is. And when I uh, kind of go back and say that my non-profitable, my non-profitable work is where I've learned most, it's those experiences yeah. that really put stuff into perspective. Because while I'm there, I mean, I took the no practice, just courage philosophy and now applied it to my life and how I approach people. And I mean, it's, it's all with courage. It, it really is. Um, so just really amazing experiences like that have set me on the right direction. Nice. And uh, you mentioned that you're living out in the middle of pretty much nowhere. Oh, yeah. And yes. you're talking about doing things for love. Mm-hmm. Uh, earlier, we were off camera. We were talking about um, rock climbing. Yeah. So is that, okay, could you just share a little bit about rock climbing yeah. and, and then your van idea that we were talking mm-hmm. about as mm-hmm. well? For sure. And are those related at all? <laughs> um, they all relate back to love and giving people experiences. Yeah. Um, because what I was blessed with Kenya is... Um, the opportunity to go and experience that. And I believe that all every experience that you have the opportunity to do will unlock more knowledge and different abundance um, to improve your life of just different knowledge. Um, So with rock climbing, um, I started training in 2019. um, And for those of you who don't um, comprehend rock climbing, because it is viewed as just like, it's a, it's a rock climbing gym, you know, you just get rock climb. But I mean, it is an extreme sport. I mean, there's people who are climbing thousand foot walls and all their weight is on their thumb. So if they slip, they fall. And if your belayer isn't ready to catch you, odds are you could probably break your legs and die. I mean, there's people who free solo. The 1% of climbers that die are the ones who free solo. Um, But getting into this culture and this environment of the climbers, um, there are a lot of environmentalists. There are a lot of people who really care and love nature. So I leaned into them just like, there is something here um, that I want to be able to provide to others. I was blessed with the opportunity to go natural climbing multiple different times and what's, what's I almost guides. Um, that's where, um, so there's gym climbing, which uh-huh. is just in a gym. We can drive there and just go climb. Right. 
natural climbing is just in nature okay. on a rock. So you have to hike out and you have to um, um, set up all your gear and everything. You climb natural rock. Mm -hmm. um, so there's three different kinds of climbing, um, four technically. There's bouldering, which is uh, short routes with extremely hard moves. Mm -hmm. There are there's top roping, which is where it's the rope and your belayer next to each other, but your rope goes over the top anchors at the top of the wall and back down your belayer. So the anchors are catching you, yeah. um, and along with your belayer. The third is uh, sport climbing, which I'm recently starting to train for, is where you set your own uh, fall protection. So you go up with a bunch of different um, quick draws, uh, just different carabiners, and you set it and clip it, clip in your own rope. And that's where if you fall, if that rope slips through your blayer's hand, like everything ends bad. Um, so it's re a really intense um, in the amount of focus. You have to be focused. What, what's the, the blayer's the person catching you? Yeah, sorry, the blayer is the person that's catching me and um, who's technically saving my life. He's the, he's the person on the other side of the rope. Okay. Um, and then the third is trad climbing, um, with sport climbing, there's bolts that have been preset. So little metal rings pretty much that you clip your, um, quick draws into, mm -hmm. um, which are just the carabiners. Um, but, uh, with trad climbing, you are just pl pl uh, placing these different pieces of equipment and cracks in different parts of the wall. And you have to find them as you go up yeah. and, um, it's, it's, that is something that I'm, I'm not sure if I can get into. It right. is another level of intensity, but, um, circling back around to just this entire environment and culture. Every time I walk into this gym, um, I climb at climb time Indy. Um, and I believe that they show what true climbing culture is and it's a, a ton of love. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your skill set is. The reason I love climbing so much is because it is a community thing. We might sit at a wall and talk about the best way to climb it, which is called beta, because you have a different body type than I do, and you may climb this route differently than I do. Mm -hmm. So I might say, hey, do you want some beta for this problem? Here's how I did it. And then if you would go and you would try, if you failed, then we would just, okay, let's try this. Yeah. So really, I mean, you may, may only be climbing on a wall for an hour, but you may have a three hour long session two hours of that time is just talking to people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about this community is like, because once you talk, it just opens up for, I mean, deeper conversations and everything. Um, and I was blessed to have the opportunity to have guided trips out into nature and really was shown what, I mean, um, how beautiful the environment is. I mean, the Buddhists believe that the best way to find yourself and your inner peace is to go out, venture into nature and don't come back in until you find yourself. Yeah. And that's true. I mean, once you take yourself out of society and the environment you're in and completely surround yourself, but nothing um, but nature, okay. uh, you, it is at its purest. I mean, is, everything is natural. Um, and with that opportunity, I looked into how I can provide this for other people in a way that people would actually want to. Because when I hike and I mean, I rough it, everything's in my backpack, my entire I mean, everything, cooking, cleaning, supplies, um, sa safety, gear, my home that I set up in for the evening, everything's in my backpack. But what I want to be able to provide, I want to be able to provide this beautiful experience of going out into nature. And that's where the van comes in, because um, my goal for 2020 is to purchase um, this van, not to go full time van life, but to renovate it and have all the gear and everything needed to where I can invite three or four people with me and say, hey, let's go to Tennessee for two or three days. Let's go, um, let's go out West. We can go to Nevada. Sure. Yeah. Just completely take yourself out of an environment and say, Hey, I have everything that we need. And all you have to do is bring clothes. Yeah. I have the food, I have everything. And I wanted to be able to show people this beautiful side of the world that a lot of people don't experience just because it is daunting. Yeah. I mean, it is daunting if you don't have the gear, if you don't know the right way to go, how, how to hike properly, what to look for, all the safety things. Mm -hmm. But with someone who does know that and who can guide and share that love and that experience with you, that's why I want to be able to provide to people because I know that something is there. I know how it can impact and change someone's life. Once, So what I do, I recommend people books based off of where they're at in their personal journeys. Um, and I just, um, at specific points in time, I'll just ask them, hey, like, or I'll just tell them, hey, I really believe that this book can impact you at this point in time in your life. I believe there's something in this book that can really guide you on whatever is next. It helped me. Mm -hmm. It's amazing watching their lives transform. It really is. And I believe the same thing can happen with nature and going out and experiencing 
um, just just peace and everything uh, within it. Um, and then I want to see what comes out of that as well. Yeah, yeah that's pretty inspiring. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we have a uh, couple minutes left mm -hmm. and we'll just go through some uh, rapid fire questions cool. for you. Uh, you've had like a pretty diverse life as far as like all your your career backgrounds or your job backgrounds, however you want to refer to them. What um, has been like the biggest misunderstanding people have either had about you or what is that you do, whether that be like school and the IEP or mm -hmm. one of your career paths or the Kenya, any anything mm -hmm. like what do you get the most questions about? Um, I definitely get the most questions about um, how. I continue to stay motivated with all these different um, or disciplined. There's a difference between discipline and motivation. How I continue to stay disciplined mm -hmm. um, uh, within all these different journeys and all these different changes and really how I stay disciplined on my vision of what I see myself because I am following what I want, not generally what the typical path is. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, as far as advice for people, is there one thing that you want people to take away? I would um, I would share the same advice that I was given by uh, Bishop James, and that's to live your life with uh, no practice but just courage because a lot of what we do, we walk in blindsided. There's a lot of conversations that we walk into with spouses, with friends, whatever, mm -hmm. where um, there is no practice. You can't necessarily prepare for it. There's a lot of different points in life with business and uh, job changes, um, starting a family, whatever it is that you don't have practice. Right. All you can do is have courage and just tackle that challenge completely. So that's absolutely what I would share with people is live your life with no practice, but just courage. Okay. And then uh, I, got, I think two more for mm -hmm. you. Whenever you were uh, growing up in that uh, school program, you said like you just felt really down about mm -hmm. yourself. What uh, did you have like a lot of negative thoughts or anything mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. And then if you did, what? what was your method for dealing with them or was it just purely that innovation class that just like changed it for you? Mm -hmm. Was there a journey that you had to go through? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I was, it was a very dark point in life. I mean, um, that was one point in time where the only time that I thought about self harm, that was right. the only point in time in my life. There's multiple times afterwards where I have gotten back uh, in a pretty dark stage of life, but i have never, I've thought about self harm again. So that's mm -hmm. the point in stage I was at. And the best thing that I did one was, um, get involved in the innovations class, of course, but um, it was sitting and thinking in my thoughts and meditating. Um, I mean, I did years and years of counseling for multiple different things and through all that, learned multiple different meditation tactics on where to put your breath inside your body, where to focus your energy to really find clarity. Um, and it just took a lot of sitting and thinking through and reverse engineering and trying to just process and find the best solution for your emotions and for your future. That was that was, um, I can't look back and think on a specific point in time where there was a shift because it was a gradual change. Right. Um, and that was the consistent thing that happened all the way through. Okay. Now, if, um, do you have any like final words or anything that, I, I mean, we did the advice part, but mm -hmm. like, is there uh, one thing that maybe you forgot that you'd like to talk about real quick? Mm -hmm. um, the main thing it, that I was told um, throughout my entire um life is that opportunities are everywhere yep. regardless of where you look at and it takes a closed mind to not see opportunities um, you have to have an open mind to allow those opportunities to come in yeah um, i believe that lines up with being a student of the world because if you are a student of the world then opportunities are going to come your way absolutely and um so one would be i have a second one as well one would be to um, seek out opportunities if you don't know what it necessarily holds for you and there's some worry and some fear think through it and possibly go after that the second one would be um, remaining disciplined on what you need to do to make your life better and mm -hmm. the, uh, there's a book 12 rules of life by jordan peterson yes. in that book <laughs> phenomenal yeah yeah okay. i was actually going to mention him later but yeah go ahead yeah, and tell great. Me more. so um 12 rules of life he talks about how we are we know what we need to do to advance our lives. Mm -hmm. we, we know. And the fact that we do know, and that can be um, not not going out and eating fast food. That can be getting up in the morning and working out. That can be talking to, and having those very hard conversations with people and There's having those like breakthroughs. Personal convictions. All of, these different things. Yeah. And the fact that we know that this is what we have to do to advance our lives and our well-being and our happiness, that means we're held accountable to those things to make them happen. 
Yeah. Um, now it's a very intense uh, way of thinking about it, but at the same time, like everybody knows that's your consciousness talking. Yep. You know what you're supposed to do to advance your life. So I would encourage everybody to really dive into themselves and really process and lay out, here are the things that I need to do to better my life. Here are the things that I'm doing that is clouding this vision. Yeah. Um, and going into next year, um, finding that accountability. Have, have you done his self-authoring suite yet? Um, I have not, no. Yeah, he I has a, a program where you go through and wow. you answer it, you know, personally. Mm. Uh, take as long as you need. Be as intimate with the questions as you can. So that way you get the help that you need. Uh, I've started it. We haven't, me and my fiance have started going through oh, it. Wow. And it's, it's really helpful because mm. a lot of times people have, either you have energy and motivation and no direction, or you have direction and no energy or motivation, right? Yeah. And what this does is it it simplifies that process because people all usually overthink things, mm -hmm. and he kind of reduces it to a much simpler way. Now it's very time consuming to go through this, of course. Like it's, I would say it probably takes a couple of days mm -hmm. of of time, but uh, it, it was really helpful for what we've gone through so far. But um, you mentioned like the opportunities thing, and mm -hmm. I've listened to a significant amount of Peterson just because I find him incredibly insightful and helpful. Very amazing. Uh, and at one point I believe he cites a, a, a document, uh, like a, a scholar paper on research of uh, people that feel lucky versus people that don't. Yeah. And they, and they had a sample size of uh, people come in and they gave them newspapers and the people that read through it, the ones that felt like they were unlucky in life, were less likely to realize that as they read through the paper that there was opportunities like receive like a gift card or something like that. Mm -hmm. And in the the in the example, those were placed in this newspaper just to see who's observant. Mm -hmm. And the people that felt unlucky in life were more likely to miss it. And the people that felt li uh, lucky were more likely to catch it. Mm -hmm. And it just shows that like opportunities are everywhere. It's just are you one going to reckon would you recognize them if you saw them and usually they're pretty obvious yeah but are you going to take the time to seek them out right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was um I've, I've always reflected on that as like it really just comes down to you mm -hmm. and your self-control or your dedication to whatever it is that you're going in as long as you're pursuing it with not even a hundred percent but just that 80 percent like mm -hmm. as long as you're continuing to move forward like you have that courage right even if you don't know what you're doing you're just pushing forward with it Mm -hmm. It'll work itself out in some way yeah. eventually. Mm -hmm. And worst case scenario, you learn from the opportunity. So mm -hmm. it's like there's there's value in it no matter what, right? It's on a different timeline. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's also amazing that you and your wife are going through that. Fiance. Together. Fiance, sorry. Fiance. It's April 25th, um, so I'm excited. Oh, wow. Congrats. Yeah, Thanks, yeah I mean, I'm, that's, that's really amazing that you two are going through that, honestly, because, I mean, <laughs> the dynamic of a relationship, um, I mean, it's two souls coming together as yeah. one, and that's that's very impactful to do together. I got lucky because uh, she studied psych, so wow. she helps me amazing. out. Amazing. And then uh, she's considering going into law. So wow. she supports me mentally and That's maybe phenomenal. someday financially. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, right now, um, the, uh, the entrepreneur route, mm. it sounds like it's going well for you. Mm. Uh, it's going well for us as well. Good. So, um, Glad. we're, uh, we're looking forward to keep finding some more clients in the region mm. and providing all the, the media needs. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, for people watching, we have the Triflix cast, and that is a sub-segment of Triflix LLC. And that's our media company where we produce, um, professional works for major clients mm. uh, a couple of fortune 100s and then of course the small mom and pop shops the weddings like all the personal ventures as well uh mm. corporate photos family photos and all that yeah but that's a just a little bit about our company Absolutely. if people are wanting to reach out to luke yeah. rex you know where, yeah. where can they find you what can they ask you um i mean they can ask me anything i mean i'm here to be a helping hand so regardless of it's not no no specific questions whatever um someone's curious about but um it's luke underscore rex on instagram would be the best thing and then you can also um follow outhouse co-working uh which is outhouse co-work on all social platforms yeah um and uh through there um i've uh, learned uh through multiple different people jeremy being an influence on how to share this exact same story we talked about today on social and just have full transparency all the way through so really everything i share on social 
is an exact exact replication of who I am. So I really want uh, full transparency with anyone that would love to ask any questions or engage in conversation. And that's uh, L U K E underscore mm-hmm. R E K S. Yep, R E K S. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah. no problem. I I, I was struggling with it whenever I first saw. It. I was like, mm-hmm. I I know it's pronounced Rex, but like. Yes. I, I've never seen it spelled that way, so it was just kind of unique. Yeah. At Luke, L-U-K-E underscore R-E-K-S. Great. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, I think that completes it. So yeah. if uh, if you have any questions, reach out to Luke. Mm-hmm. If you guys are interested in um, some filmmaking stuff, I think both of us could probably answer those questions. Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate being on the podcast, man. This Dude. was phenomenal. It's my pleasure. I'm glad uh, I'm glad we had a, such a great guest. Yeah. Uh, he said we had an entrepreneur sure. coming on. I was like, I hope it's not a personal branding guy. <laughs> <laughs> nah. I I give them a hard time. I, I really yeah. do like all the personal branding people, but it is mm-hmm. nice to see somebody that is trying to like pursue something like mm. tangible. Right. Mm. And I think there's so much value of the personal branding, but it's really, it, for me, it's rejuvenating to see like something tangible being contributed to the world. Uh, like you said, you recommend books to people and, mm-hmm. you know, following Jordan Peterson, those are people that I would look up to that don't always provide the tangible, but I, it's for me i just absolutely love like the visual you said you're an audible learner or audio right mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. i really like things that are vis- visible yeah. and t- and tangible that i can touch and interact with the world so i look forward to trying out one of your uh think tank spaces right uh, yeah, one of the absolutely. co-work opportunities yeah for sure but, absolutely in the future all right man well i appreciate you coming on yeah i appreciate it looking yeah. forward to the next conversation have a good day yeah. people watching hope you guys have a good day as well yeah thanks for listening mm-hmm.